You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 103, an interview with Kevin Quishan, facilitating the optimal health for your practice and for your patients. This week on The Dental Guys, we catch up with a colleague and friend, Kevin Quishan of now K-Squared Facilitation. Kevin is doing his dream job helping dentists and teams take their life and practice to the next level. We get excited about talking about the future of dentistry. We also ask Kevin some great questions concerning the quote fad of airway in dentistry. It's all coming your way right now on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. Hey guys, this is Justin Goodbread with Financially Simple. Now in this season of The Dental Guys, we're talking about increasing the value of our practices. But what exactly does that mean? You know, value ultimately addresses what someone is willing to pay you for your practice. Maybe you're thinking, dude, I'm young. Why do I even need to worry about this? Well, look, at any time you could have a DSO or another dentist come in and offer to buy your practice. Many of my clients have received offers to sell their practices. Now, some have opted to sell, and some have not. However, knowing your practice always has the opportunity to sell should incentivize us and cause us to focus on increasing that value. In upcoming episodes, we're going to discuss how to increase the multiple of the valuation calculation. Remember, if you have questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. Man, Wes, this is big. Yeah, because special times. Special yes. times have happened because we've come They're... full circle. Oh, man. And guess who we have back? The very first faculty member that we ever interviewed. Yep. I'd back. like to welcome. Yeah. Back, back in the ahead, day. John. Go ahead, John. No, no. I mean, that's right. Yeah. There's nostalgia here. Yeah. Because we're here with Dr. Kevin Quishan. And mm. anybody that's been listening to the show, watching the show for a long time, yeah. knows that this was a kind of a big moment for us. And because we talked about it on the <laughs> show afterward, how we were kind of like a little anxious about even asking him because it was at mm. the point where we really hadn't interviewed a ton of people. But John, we haven't interviewed really anybody well we had we so it all started back before kevin it was jeff lineberry who yeah. kind of connected us to you kevin probably, because probably. jeff's a cool guy i knew jeff yeah. long story short i want to go into it but i knew <laughs> jeff from back in the day and he yeah. only he used to practice about two hours he would he practiced in the school in the town i went to school in back when college yeah. so yeah. so i kind of knew who he was but and then we were like Wes and i were like i think maybe kevin might do the show but he's really cool and he might, you know, laugh at us. And yeah, we kind of reached out to uh, the people. Yeah. The people, the powers. The, people, the powers. So welcome said, back after yeah. all this time, yeah. Kevin. We're really glad to have you. Uh, to show, I am happy Kevin. to be back. And you guys are funny because you know how I feel about I don't, you know, for better or worse, I don't put anybody up on a pedestal. So it's funny when people <laughs> talk like, uh, especially about me, I'm like, no, dude, I'm just, I'm just a dude. That's it. So it's, it's funny to hear you say that. I'm like, really? Come on, guys. <laughs> well, we know that now. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. But I'm, but I'm nothing special. Yeah. Yeah. We, fi yeah, we <laughs> well, figured that out. You're nothing special at all. That's no. the weird thing about all of us here is that we all put our pants on in the morning. <laughs> yes. Right? We yeah, all put our pants on in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, but it's true. But it's true. I mean, it was that we didn't know because there are there are people that you ask, and they're like, "Yeah, I mean, who do you think you are to talk yeah. to me? I am far above." And, but you were so approachable, and you really helped us awesome. not only to uh, from from a 
on the show because we had a ton of response to that early episode, but it also kind of got us excited. I remember we talked a lot about at that point <clears throat> about dental education. We mm -hmm. talked about kind of where kind of you felt things had been and where they were going and kind of what you your said place the was. system is broken. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. That. Good yeah. memory. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. And so like I look at where uh, things have gone for kind of Wes and I and, and the, the podcast, but, but even more so kind of where you're at. And it's really exciting to see kind of the evolution of really both of us in terms of how we've moved ahead. And, and it sounds like you're getting to do some things that you've really always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. Yeah. And, and you're right. So, and so are you. And that's the, um, and I really mean this, that is, that is what normally happens. It doesn't always, but it's what should happen to people that just do things that, to good people that do things the right way with eth that are ethical and just, just good people. Like that is what should happen to both of you. Um, it doesn't surprise me one little bit that you're both doing more of what you love to do both dentally and with the podcast and your families. And, and, and it does, doesn't shock me at all. And, um, and I, I'm glad for all three of us. I like, mm -hmm. like really in the bottom of my heart, like this is what it fills my soul to hang out with people like you and go, yeah, you're, you're, so I, I would say the same to you like and I mean it like you, I'm, I'm not surprised and congratulations to you yeah. well it's pretty amazing to yeah. think that um, <clears throat> yeah you're right I mean you know you think that's how it should be but I guess you hear so many stories of people say hey I really want to do this I'm committed to this and it doesn't really always work out like that and that's not always a bad thing but I think you know you you, you make a great point I mean it's a it's about trying to do it right and doing it intentionally. And that's really the, where the hard work comes in is it's that intention of saying, you know, and, and, and this is something you also said back in the day, you were talking about teaching with intention, oh, you know, really? that that's what education is yeah. all about. And yeah. I feel like that has been something that <clears throat> has really impacted Wes and I in the way that we do the podcast. We're like, what do we want? We ask that every single time we do show prep, we're like, okay, what is the idea behind what we're trying to do today and what do people, what are we trying to get across? And that seems like such a simple thing, but if you don't begin there every single day, really, um, you, you can easily get lost. Even though you might have this thing you want to do, it's, it's not communicated well, it's not put together well, and you don't do all the prep. And, yep. and I know that that was something that really impacted us and it's impacted how we've done subsequent interviews and kind of just how we've approached things and some of the opportunities that just kind of come your way because people see, yeah, you're not just flying by night here. You're trying no to be intelligent about it, intentional about it. Um, and they want to be a part of that. And that's been exciting. So uh, tell us a little bit about kind of what you're up to these days, because you're, you're still doing teaching, you're still doing speaking, um, mm -hmm. still involved with some, some continuing education stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then some com kind of some completely different areas that you've gotten into. So would you kind of tell our listeners a little bit about just where, where you've been, what you've been up to in the last couple of years? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and it has, it's interesting because for me, I feel like everybody knows what, you know, you're like, well, doesn't everybody know what I'm doing and why, and why would, why doesn't everybody know why I would be doing it? And, you know, be before I was asked to come to Spear back in late 2013, um, I was actually, and maybe I never told you this, but I was, I had, I think I was a year past maybe um, finishing my master's degree in um, healthcare administration. It's like an MBA in healthcare. And so, and I had, was really um, thinking I was ready to sort of start my own business, the one I have now, um, or move into academia and start looking for like associate deanships or something like that. And um, so I, I had been doing this with, um, gosh, you know, some of my friends in Portland, like, you know, for free, you know, as a, like a pilot project. And um, so um, it, it, then I got asked to go to Spear. So when we parted ways, um, for me, it was, it was a no brainer. It was like, sweet, like you're just going back to do what you were going to do right before. And so for me, it was not a, oh my God, what do I do now? It's a, I was already doing that. And it really is. Um, it was a, it, of course, it's a little different because I learned a lot in the years I was there. So, and I evolved as a human being. So the business plan I had before I came to Spear has come to fruition now, but it's slightly different because, well, we evolve. 
and it really is a um, a very unique um, you know and that's the thing you guys I I don't like to call it coaching I don't like to call it consulting um, it's more of a f- being a great facilitator but yet you can't say I do facilitation because people are like what the hell is that um, but it really but it but for me it is it, there is actually some coaching some consulting and the big picture is facilitating positive change with um, dentists and teams and that is what I do most most days right now and, at what uh, but point it's little, please well, what well I was gonna say what 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 point did you realize that this was your you know kind of your mo in life is to you know be able to share this type of knowledge you know with mm. with dental people mm, yeah yeah um <clears throat> It probably was, I mean, I don't know. It's always been, I I was impacted. You know, you hang around with a lot of smart people and you, and you learn from them. And I had a spectacular consultant early on in the early two thousands, but then I also did workshops with a lot of workshops (laughs) with people like Mary Osborne and Joan Undershoots and um, uh, facilitation courses. We did one, a small group learning thing at Panky back in the day. Um, no, and, and so when did I know it? It's, I think it was always in me, but when did I really think that that's where I was going to definitely move in this direction was 12 when I was going through my master's degree, actually, um, all the projects we did, I would either do it because, you know, when you do those degrees, you try and make your projects real life like they're, you know, and so I was either doing it for the faculty practice because I was director of the faculty practice or every project I was like, oh, let's I'm doing it for my future business. So it really, it really started to become clear when I was going through that master's degree because I was being forced to get some clarity on with the business and everything from finance to communication to project management. Like I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, this is, it's, it was perfect. It made me set up my business very intentionally. Yeah. Mm. So, so it was probably around then. So you, um, so what is the thing that you, what happens that fires you up the most about when you go to a practice or you work with a team? Great question. What's the thing (laughs) when you feel it, you know, I mean, cause this is, cause no matter what it is that we do that we love, you know, there's, there's something that, you know, maybe, and it can be lots of things, but what Mm -hmm. types of things, you know, uh, make you know that you're being effective or that, you know, people are, are really getting it, you know, that that makes you want to wake up the next day and do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really, it's the same thing that fired me up when I was doing dentistry every day, which was helping a patient see something that maybe they've never seen before, or maybe they thought they had a vision of it, but they, they didn't think it was real. They didn't have hope. And then helping them come up with appropriate steps to move in that direction and helping them overcome the hurdles and the frustrations and give them the confidence and and so the, what fires me up is that, you know, like last night I was on a call with a dentist in Montana who is, uh, he's really growing as a leader and as a human being. Um, and it's what was appropriate for him as opposed to a guy in Philly who's totally integrating um, airway and, and, um, and systems. And that's what's appropriate for him. And a lot of people, it's, it's the team. So what fires me up is is really feeling knowing that it's something that's individualized and appropriate for each. And I get done and I'm like, man, it's not like, damn, I was good. It's like, God, that is the fun of what I've learned all these years yeah. is mm-hmm. to, is to utilize those skills in a way that's not cookie cutter. That, that is, it makes me think it makes me um, be a better listener. And so I know that's a long answer, except that it's not one thing that fires me up. It really is the, the bigger, the bigger picture, I guess. If that makes so sense. I guess really, you know, the proper <clears throat> interview or really introduction for Kevin is that Kevin, you started out um, at, was it at the university of Oregon, right? Uh, U of O is the um, college in Eugene dental school for me. Are you talking dental school? 
Yeah, dental school. Yeah, right. dental school is is actually Oregon Health Sciences University. It's not it's not University of Oregon. Just okay. But, but yes, yeah, yeah, so in Oregon. You get in trouble yeah. right there, right? Yeah, I'm just right. right. It was, it, yeah. There's people yeah. throwing like, stuff. There's been against some the hard lines right drawn. Well, <laughs> guarantee it. Throwing mugs yeah. like school yeah. mugs against John, the wall. John, we just lost a bunch of listeners right there. I know. I know. We just lost Oregon. Sorry, guys. Yeah. No. No. But that's the thing. You know, the dental school's in Portland, and it's Oregon Health Sciences University, and U of O is in Eugene, and it's a totally different entity. So, gotcha. But yes, it was in it was in Oregon West. Yes. Okay. Great. Unless I got the state right. Man. Yeah, that was a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> well, it, it was. You, uh, you st- needed to clarify right. that. Let me tell you. <laughs> you got your start there, and then yeah. kind of tell us just in in simp in simple, you know, hey, kind of like a timeline of kind of where your journey has led to K two, and um, and then going from there. Okay. Yes. And it, now this sounds like like a jerk, but but it really is K squared. The two is on yeah, top. K squared. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not K two. I'm sorry. Uh, Wes. I'm see sorry again, I'm that. like losing out. Big yeah, time. yeah. I, I'm taking yeah. over. It's been this a long interview. day. That last taking over really got me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I knew. Yeah. No, I mean, I thought I could have seen maybe that you climbed K two. You know, you look like that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. But see, I just really. That's where Wes was up. going. Is he was trying to say you look like you yeah, could climb K two right now? And actually, I kind of thought that. I was like, you know what? That kind of like goes good you know yeah no i'm the mountaineer (laughs) but yeah bring bring us bring us through that a little bit with your timeline yeah yeah the so it all started when i was three um and (laughs) i no i um, uh, no actually it it is interesting because when i graduated the really short version of the long story and it really is the short version is i went back to my hometown right and, and was an associate To, I ended up buying the practice, then he was my associate, and that all happened really quickly. But then um, my wife at the time was in medical school and wanted to do OBGYN, so, um, but she had to go back up to, believe it or not, Portland was her first choice. So I, I quickly had to f- sell my practice, but I had to find an associate. And as that was all happening, I, we <laughs> had sort of moved to Portland. So I was actually, I owned a practice in Reno while I had an associate while I was commuting every week to be an associate up in a practice in Portland until I could sell my practice in Reno. And then I ended up buying a practice in Portland. So it was like another, I had pretty much every experience that you could have as a dentist in the first six years of being a dentist. And I really mean that. Like I, there's, I don't think there's a role I didn't play as a dentist in the first six years. And that was, that was great for me. Um, But um, but what led, so I, I think a lot of that was dealing with teams and seeing it from the bigger picture. Like I just, I, I always saw it from the big picture, but that really sort of forced it. Um, and then as I grew my practice in Portland, I knew I needed help, right? That's why I started to go up to Seattle and see Frank. That's why I went to Panky. That's why I had study clubs. And it was during the, the study club era when I really had this amazing group of people um, that created a safe learning environment where we could all learn and grow together. It was like, man, that's different. And, and I got asked to start doing that for certain groups. And it, and so that was the, your short answer is that's when it started was it's this study club environment that's out of the office that helps people move towards okay. health in a safe environment that I had learned from cool people. And I, maybe I had a little bit of a gift in it as well. Um, and I thought, you know, like, I, I like being a facilitator of, of whatever health is for different people. And I think that's where I, and then I just started edging that way. Um, you know, and I sold my practice in 2010 and became an associate in it, knowing that I was going to move into academia and give it a try and, and just and get a degree, get a master's degree, knowing that that might either move into more academia or more of a business and if, by the way, I always thought to myself, if it sucked or I suck at it, I, I, I go start another practice. Like right. I, I was never, I was never worried about it. So I think it just kept evolving. I kept trusting um, my energy as I tell my kids, you know, like really, really, you've got to find that energy and trust it and try it. And if it sucks, then at least, you know, you tried it. So I wanted to lead, we were talking about it pre, pre-show. Um, I, I, for me, congruence is a big deal and walking your talk is a big deal. And if I'm going to tell my kids to do that, then how hypocritical would it be of me to not do the same? Um, so it just, it started to evolve. And as I mentioned earlier, when I was going through the program, um, it became really obvious as I was being forced to set up my business. I was like, 
no, like this, this is it. Like this is going to work. And I, and I've got the tools and the skills and the passion and the craziness to try it. And so that's, that's sort of, I don't know if that answers your question, but that yeah, was sort of great. the, the yeah. evolution of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you mentioned too <clears throat> earlier on, and maybe it was in the pre-show, we were talking a little bit about your time is split, spent between lecturing and then also facilitating or coaching or, you know, practice management and helping dentists really achieve really what mm -hmm. they want. And mm -hmm. um, what percentage of the time are you traveling and speaking now? Like for Panky or even, you know, like recently you were in Nashville. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like for, as we sit here today and on October 22nd of 2019, I currently am committed to do all of the essentials for workshops for Panky. So that's four weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's sort of the agreement right now. So that's a month out of every year for Panky. <clears throat> and, you know, like this coming, I could look at my calendar, but this coming year, like I just did AOSH last week, as you mentioned in Nashville, mm -hmm. um, you know, and for official speaking things like the Texas Dental Association this year, Midwest, you know, and, and so maybe six or eight of those a year. And then I also do some really individualized workshops usually on the weekends like I do an airway workshop that is yeah, almost two and a half days um, but I really it's in somebody's practice like like the mm -hmm. two of you you know you find you know eight or ten of your good buddies and specialists and I come to your office and we and we really actually get down to it with in a safe environment and integrated into practice so I do some of that um, uh, so those are sort of the weekend ish type things so that's probably and or 11 a year ish um and then um and then really most every every part of every other day is either having a call like a zoom call like this with um a team or i zoom in for team meetings with one of you know with the clients so i'm on their screen just like we're on the screen except i'm facilitating a team meeting um or i'm in the practice working with the dentist and team um in real life so there's not a day that goes by that there's not something um, involved yeah. with one of the practices I'm working with. Hmm. Now, what, what kind of practices <clears throat> should work with you? You know, so you got a lot of people over the years that have been in this space, you know, of, yeah. of coaching or facilitating or consulting, whatever word you want to put with it. And yeah. they all have sort of a different focus. Um, yeah. and, and it doesn't mean one's right or wrong, just different focus. And so when you are putting yourself out there as, here's, here's the kind of, of team that I want to work with. Um, mm -hmm. what, what does that look like for you? Well, I mean, that's a loaded question in a, in a perfect world. We, you know, just like you and our dental practices, we, if we got to pick our perfect patient, right. The people that give us energy that we like working with, um, we, that, that's what you're asking me right now, except what we realize is no matter how awesome our referrals are, we don't get that a hundred percent of the time. Sure. But we do have a vision of what our optimal patient is and who, who gives us energy we like working for. And for me, um, as you guys know, although I do, and I'm not just saying this to make you feel good, you're the outliers, where when you go take workshops, whether it be Koi, Spear, Panky, Dawson, um, uh, you integrate it, the two of you do, um, better than most. And as you know from going to those, that the majority of people really struggle to go back and integrate it. And, but, but, you know, they want to, you know, they do mm -hmm. and uh, most anyway. And so for me, the people that give me most energy are people who have done either, you know, a Panky, a Coisa, a Dawson, a Spear, an OVI at Texas, um, have worked with, you know, who are, and I don't want to sound judgmental, but they, when they got out of dental school, they look for something bigger. They're moving mm -hmm. towards something that's, slightly more sophisticated, if you will. Um, that's, that would be my optimal patient. My optimal client mm. is somebody who's like, man, I get it. I'm doing it, but I'm struggling to integrate it. I'm struggling for my team to see it. Actually, I still suck at being a business owner, a CEO and CFO. I don't know what the numbers mean. Um, but that, but those are the people that I, that I love working with because they see it, they've experienced it. They're just struggling a little bit to do it. Or maybe they're they're good at the technical side, but they're not integrating it with their team because their leadership skills are, are sorely lacking. 
or or they don't understand the business. But but um, but it, it's. Oh, it's I want to ask. Idea. I want to ask a question <clears throat> just based on what you just last said. And Wes, I know. I, ask you. I knew. Can, I was going to ask it myself. <laughs> I'm excited. Can you? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Here we go. So, <laughs> Wes and I have argued over this for a long time, and we okay. both pretty much feel the same way. But can you take someone <laughs> who is not a leader and turn them into a leader through training? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If they, if just like your patients, if they see the value in it, if, if I see the value in it, I am motivated to make change. If I don't see the value in it, then I'm not motivated. And I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's just, I'll talk about it all day long. And that's part of being facilitating it. It's like, you know, I can, we can tell all of our patients the benefit of being optimally healthy, but if they don't, if they don't see the value in it, they're not going to take steps to move in that direction and really embrace it. If a dentist, if we facilitate a dentist to see the value in being a leader and like, but I, I didn't want to do that. I just want to do the dentistry. I, I hate the team stuff. I, I'm not good at the HR stuff. And it's like, but, but your name is on the door, dude. <clears throat> your name is on the check and by default you are a leader whether you like it or not so maybe we should actually work on that very intentionally and yeah there's and yes you absolutely can hmm. so you're saying that you need to take, <laughs> well i'm just gonna say i mean i, yep, I, I disagree like I, I disagree with you yeah is good, I, good. I think that there are people that don't see the value in leadership and no matter because of how they're bent right? Mm -hmm. Or they're not receptive, right? To what you're saying, right? Um, they're really mm -hmm. difficult to um, see the value in what you're trying to create in leadership. And those people just aren't cut from a cloth that are ready in, at least in this point in time <laughs> in their life to receive that type of learning. I'll go the same as your patients, Wes, which is if we don't, if we help them see what's possible, maybe they didn't even see it was possible and now they see it and it seems overwhelming. And, and they say, no, it's not for me. I don't see the value in it. But what we don't want to do with our patients is go, okay, fine. I'll just fix that tooth and you can come have hygiene appointments. So I throw this vision of optimal out and, 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 I, and we don't ever talk about it again. What we want to do is we always want to hold that there for them. We always want to hold it for them and never give up on them and say, you know what? I, I know the last time we talked, you didn't, but, but here's what I'm worried about. Here's what I'm concerned about. Here's what I think would be in your best interest. And I'm still holding it here for you. I, like I'm, I'm not, I'll, I'm, my arm's still here. It's still sitting in the palm of my hand. And, and, and we help them see the value in it. But just because they don't say yes about it the first time, even the second time, um, we, there's things happening in life that can help them see that there is a path to move in that direction. And, so it's and, what you're saying, it sounds like is that <clears throat> if, if someone's ready to receive it, then, then it's possible. So, so the people that are, are maybe we view as not cut out for it, they simply aren't at that point where they're ready to receive that, that, uh, that value or to see that value. And in that case, from a, coaching or facilitating standpoint, I, it seems like that that's a challenge because, you know, you could, you could get to a, almost a, you know, never ending coaching type of situation, you know, with, and not that that's all bad. Cause I think we all need uh, coaching, no question, you know, well, I, mean, so I don't think that that's a negative thing at all, but I think that from a leadership standpoint, that's, um, that's, that's, I'm sure where you, you could reach some challenges where if somebody's not ready to receive that, they're not ready. They don't see the value in that. And they just really want somebody, they want to delegate that, you know, yeah. they want to delegate leadership, you know, yeah. to, or, or they just want to abdicate leadership, whatever you want yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, that has got to be a challenge if they're not ready to receive that. Because of course they probably say, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to be a better leader, but do they really yeah. want that? I, yeah. John, I go back to the, going back to the analogy of your patients. If we, if all, if we always say, Oh, the patient's not ready. The patient's not ready. And Oh, we'll do the treatment when they're ready. Or is there a way that we can, that we can move that process along a little bit more quickly? The answer is absolutely. We can, we're not, Oh, they're not ready yet. 
So we're just going to keep seeing their hygiene. No, what can we do intentionally to help move that process along in a real safe environment so that they can be ready sooner than just, oh, whenever they're ready? Mm. Um, so, so yeah, and that is the fun of it. I mean, that is the fun of it. It's like, yeah, that I'm, I'm, I'm not letting go of it. But, but you can't, we still have to help create a vision of what optimal is for them. Sure, so, you know, sure. I mean, let me, let me ask one more, one other question before we, I want to get into some clinical stuff too with you. Cause I love talking clinical and I think it's going to dovetail in with what you're doing with coaching because mm -hmm. your coaching is not just numbers coaching. It's actually clinical. It's think, high level clinical, but I, but I want to ask one other maybe philosophical yeah. question because you've gotten so much experience now with working with so many people over the years um, in many different ways what do you say to the generational question? Do you think that there is a, a generational difference in the, whatever we want to call it, readiness for leadership, uh, the seeing the value in leadership or ownership? Uh, because there's, there's certainly a lot of discussion about that, that there's maybe less, whatever you want to call it, less uh, risk tolerance, less, uh, you know, more maybe, maybe being more debt averse, um, hmm. maybe just simply being more afraid or, or is it really a positive thing that there's maybe just a move toward more of a group mentality, wanting to have people that you can be collaborating with, but do you see that generational change? What, and what's your feeling about the future, uh, looking at that generational change as far as what you've seen over your years? Yeah. Great. Really great question. And yeah, I don't, everybody's like, Oh, it's the Gen Xers, right? Oh, it's the, it's the millennials, right? It's, they always put it in a generation and today it's always, Oh, these millennials, you know, that got all these, a trophy for being in last place. And, you know, and that's the way they want to, they don't want to lead now, but <clears throat> I don't millennials are generational. I think it is how we have evolved as human beings, which really, and it really is different from being a millennial. It just where we, it is where we are as a society. Now it is how we have evolved. Do we want to go back to the time of the fifties where it, it was completely hierarchical and the boss was the boss and was a complete ass to everybody else. And, and everybody just sat out at their desks, smoking cigarettes, waiting for the boss to tell them what to do. I mean, there's a reason we evolved from that because we were smart enough to know that there was something better out there. And so I think our, my generation, people who, who complain about the millennials are they blame it on the millennials. It, it's just, no, it's the same as the fifties. We're there. We're evolving and there is a better way out there and there's always resistance to it. And we're going to come to the other side and go, damn, you remember back in 2019, <laughs> When we were, when we thought leadership was that, you know, mm. so, um, so I, 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 I embrace the gap. We're, we're so, especially in healthcare, you know, I talk about Peter Senge all the time, who, who I love. He wrote like fifth discipline and presence. And, you know, in the nineties, not in the nineties, he was talking about team centered systems and was using it in the corporate world and seeing amazing results. And then, you know, I talk about outward mindset all the time. The Arbinger Institute took Peter Senge's stuff and said, oh, let's call it outward mindset. And, but it's really Peter Senge's stuff and team-centered systems. But now it's 2019. Hell, we've been talking about it for over 20 years. And it's been in the corporate world for a while and working well. They're, they're way ahead of us already mm. as far as healthcare goes. So, um, so I have complete faith in it. And I, I, I tend to like it. Um, because there, because we, we evolve and, and it mo you know, historically, it's been for the better as far as leadership goes and working yeah. as human beings. Well, and I think, you know, Wes and I certainly have seen that as we've been involved with teaching and speaking that we're very positive about the future in terms of what we're seeing excited. from Real younger excited. dentists. And yeah. in fact, and, and maybe this will get us in trouble, but I feel like we're actually more frustrated sometimes with what's going on in some of the transitions with some of the older dentists who are less likely to sometimes want to pass on what they know and mentor. There's a real, right. there's a real hole in the game of dentistry right now with that lack of mentorship going on that we see. And, and it's one of the reasons things like podcasts have become more of a thing we believe in. And, and we, we think that there's some good and bad about the change in the way things are happening, but we're very positive about the, there's this amazing amount of 
of just ethical desire to like be good that we're seeing from young, younger dentists. And we're seeing this collaboration and this desire to like be humble enough to admit you don't know things and yeah. seek that out. And just yeah. with a little bit of direction toward that, um, I think it's going to be a, a I, I'm very, I feel like the future is potentially very bright if we can, if we can just kind of push people in the right direction toward the education that they need. Um, right. So anyway, Wes, I'll right. let you get into the clinical. I know we want to talk about that too. You know, I, we could talk about this. In fact, I think no, it's, it's so great, good. It's a great topic. I think we need to continue this maybe in another show. Yeah, um, love about, to talk more about that. Yeah, this is good stuff. Because and, I, because I would throw in real quickly, but then I want to. But then Wes, I mean, you guys are the uh, leading the show. But before I forget, if we ever talk about it again, I do believe also, John, that that is the mentality. And you talk about everybody's bashing the DSOs today. Yeah, I pro- I promise you that almost everybody that works in one of those who knows it's slightly production based or whatever, they know there's something better. They want to do something better. Yeah. Every single time. And I have faith in them. And I actually have faith that we can actually integrate that into the group practices and DSOs. You don't have to get out of them They Everybody wants to do it. They just don't have the tools and vision needed to start to integrate it. So I, I, I have the same, I, I have complete it's gonna faith. It's going to be interesting. In yeah. It's going to be interesting. I, There's some things I, that I, happened I totally, today with, with DSOs and man, we yeah, can go. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you though, Kevin. I, I feel like this is, this is not maybe talked about en- enough. And, and, you know, when, when you think about what, um, what we need to be afraid of, mm. you know, I, I think what we need to be afraid of is, is, is complacency. Totally. And yeah. you know it, that's our that's the issue is it or or if you are, if you are having the I'm the boss mentality, I know everything there is to know, and you know I'm going to to basically wring out every penny from everybody in my organization. Um, what what I think that, well DSOs maybe there's some truth to that aspect of certain parts of DSOs maybe, I think there's some part of that sure. that maybe rings true, but. There's also, um, like you say, I mean, I, I've just been so impressed by like we have some young dentists and one of the study clubs that I'm part of that are that are part of the DSO and and mm-hmm. how they are are trying to evolve their skills and they are and really what they're looking they're just looking for the right place to mm-hmm. be you know and I see I've seen some DSOs and West knows where I'm coming from on this where you've got kind of a uh, a totally different way of doing things, actually a very high quality right. right? and very high, you know, uh, value of dentistry and, right. and, you know, really it's just a cost sharing model um, and a, and a common theme type of model where you're saying, look, here's just how, here's how we do things and it's high right. quality and we just feel like this works. So let's just simply copy this and also be able to provide benefits to our team and, right. you know, a retirement option. And right. I mean, those are things that, um, that it just I sort of makes should, sense. Doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Totally yeah. makes sense. I agree. But it's for, an evolution not for everybody, not for everybody. It's for not for everybody. And for some it is, but for those that do it, it can, it can work. And, it, and it's I, my, I have faith that it's going to work better and better. Hmm. <clears throat> Well, I'd like to do a little clinical here. Yeah. All right. Bring um, it on. Let's, let's, let's bring in some patient stuff, right? <laughs> like we, we definitely, you know, I've missed talking to Kevin. I know. Because every time, every time we would run up to Kevin in a lecture or during a workshop, he would say something so profound. And I would look at John afterwards and I'd be like, did he just say yeah. that? Hold and on just a the, minute. One of the things that really opened our <laughs> eyes. Whatever, by the way. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, you have to say that, but no. I mean, you, you, you just understand. said it yourself. Facilitation, right? You didn't yeah, like yeah. There tell was an us intentional what to think, call. but you would, it was a question. Yeah. It was all always right. a question. All it right. was always so, like, there are intentional things that you said. This? And we're like, yeah. what? Yeah. Right. Yeah, there are intentional yeah, things that you've fine. said to us that have changed our practice. Now, mm-hmm. I know you're humble, but let's just say this is that we are better dentists because of you. Mm-hmm. And here's the interesting thing. We have changed how we look at every single patient for the last three to four years. Nice. And the biggest thing that we want to know tonight is airway a passing fad in dentistry 
or is it here to say? Now I'm going to use my use my voice here, John, as an example. And I got to be careful here because I don't know who's listening to this, but I want to be respectful as well. But there are people even in our own community, Kevin, that are very resistant to what is going on in airway. Now we know that the hardest people to grasp this concept for some reason is orthodontist. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a little bit about not orthodontist in a situation, but I want to talk about integration airway integration and mm -hmm. this evolution of it entering into our treatment planning process like mm -hmm. my you know my treatment planning you know uh, new patient experience new patient orientation if you will is at the end of it is a very pointed conversation regarding diseases mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and kind of use the frank spear mentality or philosophy of like there's three diseases of the mouth and the last one we get to is you know the the health implications of this and how the teeth fit together and and then the skeletal and all that and it just starts to morph into this conversation <clears throat> that now it's a part of our exam totally. so let's talk a little bit about that and how is it really happening are we seeing this being integrated appropriately number one or is it really a fad hmm. No, I uh, definitely it's not a fad, <clears throat> in my opinion, not even not even close. Um, you know, we went from silver points to gutta percha and root canals one day, back in the day. We went from amalgam to composite. We went from PFMs to lithium disilicate. Um, we, you know, we went from we went into micro hybrid composites. We went into fifth generation bonding agents. It's not a it, it, none of those were fads. It was us getting smarter. Mm -hmm. And, and the airway is us getting smarter. Now, I don't know why I've never used this analogy before, but people got a percha came in or, or warm got a percha came in. They were like, Oh my God, that's so easy. I'm going to start doing molars. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and they got into trouble and, and then they were like, Oh, never mind. I think I'll start referring to my endodontist again. I think airway, but some, some got really good at it and said, you know what, I'm as good as my endodontist, so I am going to keep doing more endo. Um, my ear, by the way, if my ear thing goes out, I'll just go to the computer because I just heard my uh, ear pods because I've been on calls. So sorry. It just no gave worries. me the warning like it's starting to go out. Um, but if you, um, uh, it, it, but we, we knew that if we weren't good enough, we should probably refer to the endodontist. Well, airway is the same. We learn enough about it, and then we start making smart choices. How much do I want to integrate into my office? Do I want to be doing home sleep tests and screening, or do I just want to be looking at tonsils and mal and potty scores and, and talking about it and saying, wow, that's, that's, it's, it looks like that might be something going on with that. What's, what's my appropriate next step in my practice for the patient so it's not a fad it's just how do we want to integrate that into our practices there i mean again it sounds like a stupid analogy do you know how many people back in 1995 would would not even think about doing a posterior composite mm -hmm. it was a fad this crap's never going to last it's it's it, you, you i can't wait till you guys all have to take them out and put amalgam back in again and it, but it wasn't a fad, was it? And that's in airways the same. It's like, no, it's here. And, and people are struggling to learn a whole new technique um, that's in the best interest to their patients. And it's, it's going to take a while. Um, but it, it's here to stay for sure. Do you, who is the, who has the most trouble as far as clinicians right now? Maybe speak to maybe their training or maybe their thought process. Um, integrating this into their treatment planning? Mm, the, it's interesting because some people integrate it, but they probably shouldn't be because they don't have the training. So they're doing a whole bunch of mandibular advancement appliances, but they don't have an understanding of what happens when you jack the jaw forward and what happens with the muscles and occlusion. And <clears throat> so they probably shouldn't be integrating it. And then there's the people that should, right, that understand the whole stomatic mathic system, but they're struggling because they're like, oh my, like I'm, I'm, I'm already looking at bites. I'm already 
taking mounting models. I'm all, I'm already looking at occlusion. And now you're telling me that I can't restore the bite because it might be happening because of airway, but I'm going to pretend that nobody told me it was airway so I can still restore the bite. And, and like I was five years ago without even thinking that I had to, why, why I'm having to restore the teeth in the first place. Is that, so those are the people that are struggling because they, they sort of want it, but they, they know that it's going to take a little more work or it might change the way they look at patients. That's one person who's struggling to integrate it. And the other is really, um, it, it is just a, how do I get my team on board? And I really want to, I went and did some training, but, but I don't know how to create systems around it. And it seems like something that's totally new, except it's not, it's just part of, of looking at our patients comprehensively. So those are the two that are struggling to integrate it, I think. Mm-hmm. That's do you good. feel that uh, what you know Wes kind of alluded to earlier that that the orthodontic community really fully embracing that idea is is maybe the the push that we're going to need to really make this a universally accepted thing i I don't know obviously you can you can start grassroots, right? And you can say, well, we'll teach, you know, general dentists to kind of one by one or group by group. Uh, and eventually that'll be there. And one day dental schools will be integrating this into the curriculum, you know, maybe 10 years down the road uh, or longer. Uh, it seems like the orthodontic community being the growth and development specialist potentially would be the one that um, could potentially turn the tide on that. I mean, do, you, do you feel like that's the way that things could be integrated more quickly or do you feel like really we're, we're probably going to be where we are, where it's basically going to be a start from the general practitioner up type of approach? I guess my question back to you is why do you think that's not happening in the orthodontic community now? Well, I think it is happening, but I think that it's happening um, the same way that the se- it seems like in let me let me let me back up and say it this way it seems like in the general dental world for better or worse there are um, sort of it's become it's it has become a much less you know unidimensional thing you know we have so many different uh, uh, people going to so many different uh, types of educational events for instance or or maybe doing everything uh, online or maybe they're you know, they're, they're not necessarily all hearing it from the same place. And that was maybe easier 30 years ago when the places you went were more limited and you didn't have, you know, so many different places you could get information and it's more of a shotgun approach going on in the general dental community. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems that way. And it seems that way as we get into the podcast world, it's, it's no different. I mean, it's like, it's all over the place yeah, right, in the specialty right. world. It seems like I guess I would equate it to when we go to in the implant world, okay? If you go to the general dentist, quote unquote, centric implant meetings, there are some crazy, crazy fringe stuff being taught. I mean, crazy yeah. stuff, things that are not proven, no research support, and yet it's on the main podium uh, right, or right. in the workshops. When right. you go to a specialty based implant meeting like the Academy of Austin Integration or the Amos meeting or Perio, they're going to be in generally in general much more focused peer reviewed um, you know there's much more refereeing going on yep. and it seems like it's easier in those communities to to make a change because it's more of that that it's less shotgun and mm-hmm. and I guess I'm not saying it's not it's not happening but I feel like it's certainly not happening uh, across the board in orthodontics in in a yeah. in a way I know that it's in the journals it's been right. in the journals Right. Uh, it's at meetings. We're seeing it, right. but right. man, it seems like it's, I feel like, it, is it maybe, and maybe this is, I don't know, we got to be careful what we say, but it seems like it's more that it affects their business, you know? And I worry yeah. is, if that, is that a concern? Is that maybe why this is so yeah. slow to change? Because people say, Oh, if I start embracing this, then now yeah. I have to have these conversations about orthognathic surgery that I don't want to have or about right. what is extracting premolars doing to people's airway. And is that a concern? And I don't know if that's why, but it seems like those are the people that were having the hardest time, at least from what we see going to courses, getting to um, convince them that this is a change that they need to make. Yeah. I mean, none of the three of us are orthodontists, right? And so we can speculate and we all, we have friends and we're in the community. So we have some knowledge around it, but 
you know, I, my, I, and I do know some orthodontists, right? We, we do. And, and we know some really good ones. And the dilemma I think in the ortho world is not so much that the American Academy of Orthodontics is not embracing it. I think that it's new to them and there's new techniques and new thought that we need to create space for the tongue. It used to just be put a wire in and, and just make it sort of U-shaped and make it make the smile good. You remember back in the day, both of you, that when, when there was more of a push in the ortho world to start thinking about centric relation and, and making the teeth function properly, <clears throat> right? Um, and, and now, by the way, you tell me when you can't hear me because I'll just take these out because I just heard another one. Um, but um, when, when it became, it was fringe to start placing for the orthodontist, start looking at CR. And then when do they teach it? Do they go back into residencies? Well, you can imagine in the ortho world today, when they start talking about expanding four-year-old kids and and starting to look at airway because it's a constricted arch as opposed to saying oh it's in your genetics so i think the frustration and what we're seeing is part of a uh, uh how do we integrate it and um i just i just got into ortho so i could put on some brackets and straighten somebody's teeth and and come to work every day and not think um and so i when it becomes a thinking person's game uh, so there's some people that don't want to think. And I, and I think that's the pushback a little bit And there, but you see the really smart orthodontists that love thinking and they're like, Oh yeah, let's figure this out. And yeah, I want to help this kid be healthy because I know if there's airway issues early on and we prevent it, man, this kid is going to grow better. They're going to be do better in school. I mean, and those are the people that, that embrace it. And, but, but a lot of people don't want to be thinkers. Right? And you know, who wants this, Kevin, you know, who wants this? and who never says no, rarely ever do they say no, is the parents of the children. Yeah. When yeah. you present this in a simple way, they go, tell me more, right? Yeah. Because they're for it. And you just don't see yeah. people, they're like, this makes sense. Why right. is my physician yeah. not saying my anything about it? Right. My kid's wet in, his, wet in the bed. He's tired during the day. He's yeah. irritable. Um, and oh, and by the way, did you happen to notice that he's got huge tonsils and, and allergies all the time? You're like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, and by the way, they're not getting human growth hormone, you know, for right. the first hour of sleep right. every night. But right. let's not worry about it. Let's just, uh, right. you know. Right. Yeah. So, right. of course, every, every parent is totally down with it if they see that how it is affecting the yeah development of their child, right? So going back to, from the general dental standpoint, and, and one of the things that we learned from you when we were taking workshops with you was uh, talking about splints. We talked a lot about splints. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I remember you saying that, that did get us really thinking mm -hmm. was that, you know, <clears throat> I don't know, guys, if I'd be, uh, you know, making a splint uh, without taking a look at airway and, and, totally. you know, I, I'm, I, you told us, you know, I'm not making splints without uh, home sleep tests or without some type of screening tool mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And, and I want you to speak to that because when we heard that it was a game changer for us mm -hmm. um, and tell us if, if that's, you know, kind of what you, what your thought is at this point and, and, and what, what does, uh, what does that look like in a, cause that's a, that's a big change in a general practice. Totally, but it almost makes it more fun. You, it's not that we don't do appliance therapy. It's that you think about why are you thinking about putting the piece of plastic between their teeth? What is the reason that you're even having the conversation? Now, I, I'm fine doing appliance therapy if the reason I'm putting a piece of plastic between somebody's teeth is that they're being restored. You know, but let's, let's say they have a mouthful of old composite and a bunch of old amalgams and it's just evolved or, you know, it, one filling at a time over 20 years, just everything's all jacked up, right? I mean, their bite has evolved to this, this huge slide and aesthetics are all over the place. And if I want them to experience optimal before I restore their teeth, um, or if I want to make sure the sensitivity goes away or the teeth firm up, um, we, to get rid of the frematis, then, then for me, I will use that appliance all day, every day without thinking twice, as long as there's no airway issue. 
However, if the reason I'm putting that piece of plastic between their teeth is to protect their teeth because they're destroying them, um, because they're sore from clenching, like usually the reason we are putting a piece of plastic between somebody's teeth is because something good is not happening, right? <clears throat> and and more the majority of the time, the reason that something not good is happening has to do with them coming forward, posturing forward, destroying their front teeth because they need air. We know that today. I mean, we know we, we have more polysomnograms these days and, and, rec and nighttime recordings of people doing it that we didn't have 20 years ago. It's like, no, look, that person's doing it. And, and look, we're, we have this little micro arousal, right? As this hypopnic event was about to start and then they ground their teeth because they were coming forward from air. I mean, we just saw it. So, uh, and that's why they're destroying their teeth. So if, if, if we know it, then I don't want to put the piece of plastic between their teeth. To protect. Now that I will put a piece of plastic between them. It just might be forward to open the airway so I can protect their teeth and give them air while I'm figuring this crap out. Right. Yep. So I, it's just not a traditional, you know, Michigan appliance or Tanner appliance or, a, or, a, um, you know, a fully seated collar position appliance because of that then we're actually giving them a place far back and, and they're I'm not, I mean, we're not really suffocating them, but we're not really helping the reason that they are destroying their teeth. So I think that you're, you're going right into the next question, which is there's <clears throat> these control points and then there's also resolution. And yep. I was just, somebody responded to our last episode today and, and John even has had a patient already go through a procedure to resolve nice. airway. Nice. And I, I have two patients this week that declined CPAP treatment for that of studying how to resolve it with skeletal um, orthognathic surgery, you know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's interesting to me that we're starting to develop these opinions now that we can prevent, <clears throat> right? As a child, we can control as a child or an adolescent, and let's just go forward and say an adult, we can control them to some extent. And then there's the option of, like you put it, optimal health, which is resolution, right? Are you of that opinion that you can control and resolve these issues? Um, we have to figure out what it's going to take to resolve it in the first place. And, and I will go really quickly jump because you said, you know, by Max Lear, well, you said skeletal surgery, which, you know, you, there's a lot of MMA surgery, That's know, right. Max, mandibular advancement, you know, and it, there's a lot. Actually, yesterday I did a, I spent the morning recording a little course on airway for the AACD um, for their website. And so I, I was prepping for that. And, you know, you look at the, at the current literature, current peer reviewed literature that says how many people with MMA, with mandibular maxillary advancement surgery, actually got better. It's not all of them, by the way. And that's a, that's a crazy <clears throat> surgery to go through if you're not gonna get better. So for me, it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's a thinking person's game. It's why are they not breathing? You know, like your patients, how do we know that it wasn't just nasal patency? How do we know they didn't have a deviated septum with crazy allergies and got in the habit of breathing through their mouth? And all we have to do is deal with the allergies and some polyps and fix the septum and mouth tape. And, and they're like, oh my God, I, I never mm -hmm. knew I could be, feel mm -hmm. this good. Yep. Well, okay, that's resolve, isn't it? That's complete that's right. resolve. It was no surgery at all. Um, and what if it really was that, that you had to deal with their nose and help them train to breathe through their nose again by mouth taping. And you just needed to increase the volume orthodontically by widening. And maybe they have collapsed over the years from all this grinding, from all the airway issues. And we actually do need their vertical opened up. So we, we expand and open and deal with the airway. And did we just resolve them? Potentially, if that was the choke point of the airway. Now, if it mm. truly is the, the, um, the pharynx, you know, that is, a, you know, I call it the air hole. If it's just a teeny tiny air hole, then how big can we make the air hole? And, and by doing just mandibular advancement, sometimes that works. Mm -hmm. And because maybe it's just a retrognathic jaw, you know, um, but that's a big surgery too, if we don't prove it. So for me, 
Um, it's, it's doing our best to prove that we can resolve it before we go, oh, just do everything. And I'm sure you're going to be better, right? So, so my question is, do I believe we can, we can resolve? Yeah, absolutely. I believe we can resolve. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Well, so I think that, uh, the, the, maybe the final question we want to, we want to go to, to talk about, cause it's, it's definitely, um, a controversial topic in a big way is, and you kind of alluded to this earlier about how much more data we have now showing the connection between Bruxism and uh and airway Mm -hmm. um so what what's your feeling based on what you have read and seen about um what the incidence is you know what's what's the connection or correlation between uh bruxism and airway and how strong do you think it is uh because there's certainly different opinions it seems like depending on what you read there are some different opinions on what the true connection correlation is incidences talk talk a little bit about that because there's people that still believe well this it's only rarely due to airway and then there's people who believe it's always due to airway what are your what are your thoughts on that yeah right and again we people wish that it was just one thing like why 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 can't it be four things and when we have to deal with all four of those things Mm -hmm. and so is there a lot of data that says yes that that airway is connected to nocturnal bruxism like absolutely um we we know that to be to be the case and and because that we we see it we see it happen with these with the sleep studies we we watch we watch them um collapse we watch the breathing stop we see this little micro arousal we see them come forward and grind 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 we see the heart rate go up to wake them up again we see them start to breathe and then the grinding stops it's, it's that to me is pretty straightforward right um and, and so we've seen it so is it directly related to it absolutely but it could also be as we talked last time is what could it be a little um um you know upper airway resistance syndrome so things aren't going great but it, that person because they're upper airway resistant and haven't been sleeping well for years and they're slightly depressed and so it's a little upper airway resistance with a little uh, added juice of of taking an ssri and now they're grinding their teeth well did we look at both of those yeah you know um, so we, we, that's the thing. People are like, Oh, it's not always this. No, but it's probably like a little bit of three things. And are you a thinking person yeah. or are you just looking for the one thing to say it's yes or no? And that's, that's, that's right. again, that's, I, I get a little emotional about it, but it's like, it's, it's, it, as I say, it's a thinking person's game today. Yeah. So yeah. people don't like to, think. They, we went into dentistry so we could just like orthodontist. I just want to make teeth straight. Just like dentist. Can I just spin a tooth down and put a crown on yeah. a broken tooth? Well, well no, that, I'm sorry, that begs, that begs another question, which is if someone's looking to get started in that world of learning more about airway and how this relates to um, bruxism and restorations and occlusion, um, do you think that they should be starting with a study of airway? Or do you think they should be starting with treatment planning um, and occlusion and uh, understanding that world first uh, or you know, how, how does someone evolve that? Because it seems like there's people that they go right in to a course where they, well, we'll, we'll teach you how to make appliances mm-hmm. for instance. <clears throat> but what we're talking about here with, you know, whether you're making a decision about orthognathic surgery versus, you know, an appliance versus upper airway issues, versus opening vertical versus splint therapy, man, you have to, seems like you have to have a really solid base in some of these other areas. But I don't know. I mean, what do you, what do you tell somebody who comes to you and says, I want to integrate airway into my practice, but they really, maybe they're early in their career or they maybe late in their career, but they haven't taken more of a comprehensive look at something like occlusion, for instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And again, does it, does which comes first, the chicken or the egg, or does there have to be a perfect path? And can't we, can't we start to do both at the same time? Could you go to say, you know, Panky and start E1 and start learning about the comprehensive exam 
in that same year, you can go, well, same to Panky or me or anybody and learn uh, and learn about airway while you're learning about occlusion. Can't they, can't, can't they be? And by the way, shouldn't we be teaching them at the same time? Shouldn't, you know, as we talk about treatment planning today, it isn't one or the other. It's like, yeah, as you're looking at the whole system, you know, the airways related to it and your treatment planning, as you guys know, I feel it, EFSBA. So it's, yeah. it's it, I don't think it has to be where do you start? It's like you start, it's just sort of part of the whole package now. Yeah. Like you don't have to do one and then the other. It's they're, they're connected now. And is that how Panky's looking at that? Uh, is as the way that they're teaching, are they integrating those things together? Yeah, m- more and more. Um, I mean, you you guys know um, Steve Carsonson, John Rammers, sure. and <clears throat> and you know they do the workshop there. But um, there's there's a lot of places to go to start to integrate it or or learn while you're also learning about occlusion and systematic treatment planning. Hmm. Um, yeah. That's- well, this is um, one of these things that we love to talk about because it has impacted our practice so much. I think that um, to not continue on here, but is to continue on maybe in another show yeah, where we discuss yeah. some of these other things that we've been talking about earlier and, and continue on in this airway conversation because there's there's more things that I I've and John and I have actually really just dove head first into Mm -hmm. with with our practices and we're excited about the future and i want to say this lastly to kevin again is that we really appreciate um how you impacted us yep um and how you're impacting us now um Mm -hmm. because when we want you to just keep doing what you're doing i mean yeah and how do people how do people find out about what you're doing like if they want to uh, figure out more or learn more about what you are up to, where, where would they go to, uh, to learn more? Uh, website, ksquaredfacilitation.com is the easiest. And a Facebook page, just do K squared facilitation. And, or my email is, uh, cause I, you know, I give my cell phone. I, I have nothing, you know, I'm, I'm an open book. So, and it's just, my email is just Kevin at K squared facilitation.com. And awesome. um, I do, you know, I, I do, individual you know really customized workshops or you know there's a guy who we we did the um a comprehensive exam and photography and appliance therapy in his office with his team like you mm-hmm. want to learn as you guys know you want to learn it learn it in your office with your team you know so yeah. for me it's as i said earlier it's very it's very individualized everybody is is different and we got to find out what optimal is for them and take appropriate steps. So that is, that is what makes it fun, right? That's yeah. awesome. Well, you heard where to reach out to him. And I think that if you are interested in maybe taking your practice, like we always say to the next level, um, you know, we highly recommend that you check out Kevin Quishan at uh, K squared facilitation, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe just maybe John, I'm going to maybe hold Kevin to something right now is that we could get Kevin, to come out and talk to our airway study club oh, in man. East Tennessee. That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. We, we need to talk after the show about that because yeah. uh, so, I got some, yeah, I got some other things to ask you, but you know, we, we've just so enjoyed having you on. Love to have you on again, Kevin, sometime and talk more about some of the stuff because I feel like um, what I, what I love about this, when I think about coaching and I'll kind of finish with this, you know, when I think about coaching, facilitation, consulting, whatever you want to call it, um, as I said kind of earlier, this is a little different. This is not somebody coming in your practice who is, uh, who's got an MBA uh, or is a financial planner or something, and they're going to talk about numbers only, although it sounds like you're very familiar with that for sure. I mean, I that is, obviously, yeah. you, you went through the business training by, in a big, major way. However, you, know, you not only know dentistry, having done it in all phases, but have taught it you know, at a very high level, continue to teach at a very high level. It's rare to have that combination of things in in a coach and in a facilitator um so definitely something uh for our listeners to to check out and i think they'll they'll want to do that um if you want to check out more about us the dental guys of course you know where to find us dentalguys.net uh also check us out on facebook on twitter on the instagram uh we've got all kinds of places you can interact with us and find more out about what we're doing we've got some kind of big announcements coming up right around the corner probably next episode we'll be probably talking next about, episode we'll be able to talk about that yeah what's going on in the spring with us so we'll let you know whoa yeah whoa 
but at this point, you know, let us know what you thought about the show. Let us know uh, what questions you have for, uh, for Kevin. Uh, he's got given you some ways to get in touch with him. Let us know if you want to hear more about uh, what he has to say. Uh, Kevin, it's been great to have you on. Uh, thanks again for being with us Thank on the you. show. And uh, for Wes and Kevin, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.